So I introduce myself once again. My name is Domenico Piscitelli. I work for Bureau Van Dijk. And I uh, handle clients that we define as government and public. So all those clients that are not private companies. My is a speech will explain a tool that could be useful in this uh, context after having heard the uh, speeches before uh, me, uh, it seems that one of the very relevant problems is that of data information, and this is pretty much our job. I can't say that these tools can solve 100% of our issues, but they can certainly probably be uh, support, an important uh, support. I'd start with a very brief introduction of my company and what my company does. I suppose most of you have never even heard about this company. Bureau Van Dijk is a multinational company. It was born here in Belgium in the 80s. Today it has a global presence in more than 40 countries all over the world. And since August they enter the Moody's group. Maybe this is a name you're more... Uh, comfortable with and um, but although there is we are almost an independent department division within the company we have 40 uh, offices all around the world mainly in Europe and uh, the international side would be strengthened in the future and our job our job is to gather data so we gather data on basically all companies in the world. It seems like a pretty banal to thing to say, but we're talking about 210 countries and uh, that have uh, rules, uh, norms on uh, data, which are completely different. And we cover around 300 million companies, talking about legal entities, entities on which we are gathering information and we're not talking about database anymore we're talking about big data here enormous amount of information I certainly I'm not the first one to tell you that when you have a, such a huge mass of uh, data and being unable of uh, managing it is almost as not having it at all so the added value that we bring is to digitalize these uh, uh, this information and uh, we develop software platforms that allow to uh, handle the information and identify the information that's specifically useful for uh, uh, a specific analysis. So basically we gather information and data which we gather from public sources and uh, certified information either a public source, for example in Italy the Chamber of Commerce, which is the body that gathers information on uh, companies. In other countries where maybe there isn't the presence of such uh, an entity, there are other organizations, accredited organizations, that gather information. And that's what we do. So the starting point is uh, economic and financial information. We started from there, but then we uh, we went a bit beyond the mere gathering of financial information. We started gathering financial balance data, basically. But then we understood that by connecting the information and putting them together and standardizing it, uh, the wealth of information we had was uh, increased greatly. And so we talk about sectoral operations and extraordinary financial uh, operations and uh, information on physical uh, people. Companies are uh, independent entities, but they're made up of people that take decisions. Uh, there's managers, people with responsibilities, and we just started mapping them. And we realized that uh, these people were present in many companies. And we understood that the same people were present physically in many different companies and so sometimes it was very clear that there was huge conflicts of interest. Then we uh, extended also to a phase of evaluation because since we had all this data the, the next step was to try to understand this data 
and interpret it. So we have six or seven external companies that do this as a job to try to assess this information. So for example, it's just like asking the opinion of seven analysts and ask them if the, the data we have uh, compared with a period or geographic area, if, these da if this data is positive or negative, then we extend it to a more qualitative kind of data, not only figures, but so the SG world environment, social governance, and the presence uh, within st group structures of uh, people which were politically uh, exposed or uh, entities or um, people that had to be condemned for particularly serious crimes. So believe me, this is an immense amount of data. And we tried to standardize all this information, tried to make it homogeneous. And even this seems uh, obvious, but uh, when data is uh, gathered in different countries, it's in different languages. So for example, data from an American company is in English, uh, from Germany it's in German. So. Uh, having a platform that gathers all this information but is unable to compare it would have been almost useless. So all the information is available in one language and that's already something pretty useful. And they're also on, uh, in a format that is comparable. For example, let's talk about balance uh, data. Uh, in Italy there's three different formats. Imagine 210 countries decided to gather this kind of information and standardize it in a single format so that any single company, regardless of sector or juridical uh, position, that it would have been comparable with all the others. Same uh, thing with the sectors of activity. For example, in some countries there's a national ranking. In the Europe there's a national European kind of uh, subdivision. So we created uh, charts that allowed to identify all the companies that perform the same activities regardless of their official legal designation. The final result is that we created data banks and uh, today I'll talk a little bit more about Orbis which is um, probably the most n known and uh, the widest, the biggest one. We gather information on around 300 million companies, 400 million physical people, 1.5 million uh, financial operations. So it's the most complete database of this kind of information. And I'd like to add also in this context, this is a tool that is used a lot by multinational companies and they use it to monitor the counterparts that they are engaged with and uh, mainly uh, suppliers because I seem to understand that main problems are in the supply chain. Before following the public government sector I followed the private sector and I also followed big projects on Ital Italian multinational companies and their uh, risk management of uh, suppliers because there are different methods to defend themselves from uh, these kind of risks, uh, creating insurances on credit, for example, but it's hard for them to monitor the risk that comes from suppliers. So I found myself, uh, I remember a project with 280,000 suppliers involved. It was an Italian company working in the energy sector that had 280,000 suppliers and they monitor using this tool. And uh, they evaluate uh, the financial health of a strategic supplier, for example, uh, make sure that they don't uh, go bankrupt or that they don't create uh, problems in the short term, but they also use it for scouting initiatives to identify those suppliers that cannot perform their activities in the best way possible, but they also have a lower uh, bargaining power uh, or uh, a c 
cost structure that is easier to handle, so they're more flexible. So the same tool is used by the other side as well. So among all the things we do, I've talked about different typologies of information, but maybe the one that's closer to the topic of today is how we well, we study s s s company groups. This is pretty complex because if you think that not even uh, fiscal agencies are capable of uh, understanding the group structure of many multinational companies. Of course, I'm Italian, so I have a more my vision is more focused on Italy. There's around 30,000 companies that have foreign investors, foreign stakeholders. So if I take an official report, a public report of the company, I can see that I have um, information on stakeholders, shareholders. One is Italian, another is a person that has a company with uh, legal offices in another country. So to un actually understand who these people are, I should go even more in depth, so I have to open another report and uh, study the situation of this new company and so on. And we did this. We did this job and we um, gathered information on the various shareholders and we managed to reconstruct the, ch the ownership uh, chain of basically all the companies in the world. So on one hand, this allows us from the shareholder point of view to identify who the main shareholders are actually are so the people that actually take decisions they earn profits and uh, you know and sometimes you actually discover unexpected things and that's the reason why we work with around 80 tax agencies basically in uh, in the world because multinational companies use this structure, their international presence to uh, move profits in countries where, of course, taxes are lower. But then maybe they say, oh, no, but we're investing in research and development. Well, yeah, you, you moved all your profit. So, you know, you have a, a huge advantage if compared to a company that has a presence that's uh, less global and does not have the chance to do what you did. This is an example. I don't even know. <laughs> this is a Volkswagen. It's totally uh, random. I took uh, an example that had a sufficiently complex structure so that could allow you to understand the, 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 the complexity of the structure, but not too complex. So this is starting from Volkswagen Italy. This is the structure of the shareholder. So if you take the report of on Volkswagen in the Chamber of Commerce in Italy, I, I see that the main shareholder is Automobile Lamborghini SPA. Maybe when we talk about this group, we know that it's the Porsche family that has basically the highest share, but maybe not many know that the Qatar government has a share of 16.8% of the Volkswagen group. I mean, it doesn't mean anything specific, but not every time you, you, you know about these things. And it could have also some important aspects that could be taken in consideration in this context. Here, this is a, more of a, a, a chart. Maybe it's more readable. This is the participations. It's even more complex because not even in the official balance uh, sheets, our companies have to indicate participations in other companies. There, they must do that only when it's in the um, in the final um, financial balance or in a group balance. But if the participation is inferior to fifty percent, sometimes it doesn't even show up. And then there's many mechanisms that allowed to uh, elude this 25% uh, share. So instead of having 50% from A to B, I have 60% from A to C, and for, then from C to A, once again. I mean, it's easy to uh, fool these, uh, these rules. 
So this is the structure of the IKEA group. And here um, I, I had to cut the, the list because the, there was not enough um, space to fit it in the in one page. But from this list you can see both the presence in many, many countries. So this is a group that ha is present in many countries. And a typology of company that it's different. And to each of these there is a different uh, NAC E code. So, to understand how a multinational structure can position itself in different uh, sectors, here I only took the first sector, the, the main one, but uh, for example they concentrate on uh, wholesale commerce or logistics in another country. It would be interesting maybe to understand the concentration and how the different norms or environment can uh, influence the decisions to create a subsidiary company in one nation or another so that they can perform certain activities. And in this slide I also included the profit and the number of employees of each of these uh, participations. So diversity is important here as well. There's uh, offices with four employees, others with 6,000. So even this is a certainly um, relevant aspect. The next step is actually something uh, additional and it's something we started doing uh, pretty recently. So until now we saw what companies have already done. Now we want to understand what do companies want to do in the future by gathering information on all the extraordinary financial operations that involve all the companies in the world and all the information that we are able to gather because there is no database, there is no institution that gathers this kind of information before these operations uh, are actually performed. So we started doing this, we actually started this quite a while ago. Right now we cover uh, 1.5 million uh, operations so it's not longer, we're no longer talking about companies, we're talking about the operations so operations of M and E, so uh, acquiring uh, already operative companies. So uh, from an international point of view, we're talking about cross-border operations. And when a, a country, a company from one country acquires a company from another country that maybe is from the same sector or maybe a mm, closed sector or maybe a completely different sector, but also other operations that are in the FDI language are defined as greenfield we, uh, and we're talking about those operations of uh, opening a new entity in a new country so not acquiring something that already existing but opening a new uh, plant or a new office and this is an example that should be updated to the month of April the Zalando company which announced that they want to open an office in uh, uh, for uh, logistics, um, uh, transportation, distribution in Lombardy, with an estimated value of 18 million euros and a potential of 50 employees. This operation still has not been uh, uh, carried out, but at least to uh, be able to know something before that this something happens could be an advantage. I try to be brief and um, focused, but if you have any questions, I'm obviously available for any kind of uh, comment or question.